All righty. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to week 11 of Principles of Commercial Law, our very final substantive topic for the week uh, and one that's um, not accessible, as you no doubt would have gathered looking at the um, at the assignment. So, yeah, this is this is a chance for us to be, I suppose, the pressure's off in some sense in terms of, you know, trying to really ring every last detail that we can out of things. But I think it also opens up some really interesting um, ideas and points of discussion that we'll make use of today uh, and sort of, you know, think a little bit more broadly about the role of technology in commerce and its implications for commercial law. But before we do that, um, we're in the middle of, of the assessment, obviously, it's due next Wednesday. Um, are there any questions about the assessment before we get started? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yep. Um, I guess my um, question sort of comes around more structure rather than content. And mm -hmm. that is, um, and look, this could be because perhaps I'm not 100% on the right path, possible. But I'm feeling already that with problem one, my words are going to exceed that 600 and more so in problem two, I'm going to have a little bit less words. Are you, like, is that going to fit within the constraints of the assessment or are you still thinking that it should be equally weighted 600 each? It's, if if it's a little bit imbalanced, that's fine. I'm, I'm more looking at the total of the two rather than, um, rather than, the individual sort of 600 okay. each, um, you know, keep in mind, of course, that, so I suppose the caveat there is that, you know, they're both worth equal amounts of marks. And so, um, you know, I, I, I would be very concerned if you had, you know, a thousand words for one and, you know, only a couple of hundred for the other. Um, but yeah, it's not, it doesn't have to be exactly even um, between the two questions, that's that's fine. It is a maximum of fourteen hundred, isn't it? Yes. Oh, is that right? Yeah. 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 So I mean, even if you went, say, for argument's sake, closer to sort of that eight hundred for problem one, and you use your balance on problem two, that's still going to fit with what you consider. Yeah. Constraints. Yeah, I would be. I wouldn't be. And I mean, you know, it's it's again, I'm more focused on. The, as long as everything is there, then, yeah, the exact breakdown of the words is not, yeah, I, I wouldn't be too stressed about that. I think, yeah, eight, 800 to what would that be then? About 400, 500 is, yeah, yeah, that's, that's probably not too bad. I wouldn't be stressing about that. Um, so, yeah, that's probably all I can say on that one, but yeah, it no, doesn't, it, just, it doesn't have to, to be me, exactly 600 for the two. Yeah. I just, the way that I'm reading problem one, I mean, there's a little bit more to cover off with regards that she's requesting quite clearly two separate sort of avenues. Like in mm, the question, mm. it states that she's looking at two different avenues or two different issues or can be one. I know that, but I'm trying not to give too much away. <laughs> Um, but what I'm trying to say is that, like, it, from my perspective, there's a little bit more to cover off because of those two distinct sort of areas that she's looking at versus the second one. Um, again, there's a couple of things there, but I think that I can cover those off quite more succinctly than I can yep. problem one. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, yeah. To, to answer your question, I'm, yeah, I'm looking at the total word count rather than the individual word counts of the two questions. Cool, thank you. Fantastic, uh, any other questions? Perfect, all righty. Well, let's jump into a discussion of um, e-commerce and e-commercial law. Uh, and I thought sort of in keeping with um, so sort of the past few weeks, we could start with more of an open um, discussion, a bit more sort of pondering about um, the principles behind these kinds of things. And in particular, let's start thinking about this idea of um, the whether or not electronic and traditional transactions are equal and, you know, expanding that out more broadly to sort of 
e-commerce and and the way that we do things electronically whether that is in fact equal to the traditional i suppose hard copy ways of doing things um or you know are there still some inequalities and what are the impacts of that i think um time is a factor i think with e-commerce it has really lessened the time in how things are turned around, mm -hmm. um, particularly with communications. Um, I think one of the things there or a trap to fall into though is understanding and in the readings during the week, I was looking at um, the time in which someone receives a communication. Is that at the time it hits the inbox or is it at the time it hits the um, organisation server? Um, which you know could um could end up being problematic in some instances mm -hmm. um, but yeah there's certainly a lot of pluses on the e-commerce side with timeliness and and the quick turnaround and um just the convenience of it as well um yeah so absolutely so the yeah. the sort of the efficiency um and yeah the time factor is is a way in which these two sort of modes are not equal, but we sort of feel like it skews in favour of the electronic mm -hmm. means. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I think there's potentially more pitfalls um, okay. for consumer error. Yeah. Um, not like of their own doing, but because we've got an ageing population that is not, you know, tech savvy. Yep. Um, quite easy to overlook particular places. And I mean, this whole COVID is really relevant of this particular situation. I mean, I know of a friend's mum that was doing the QR check-in and she was just taking the photo and she wanted to know how the government could keep check of all of her QR codes when they were still in her photo stream because she wasn't actually filling in the details. I mean, that's an older person that's not okay with technology. So mm. e-commerce is definitely a loophole that can cause a, a, quite a few pitfalls. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This sort of, and and I think the generational thing, yeah, is huge. But even when we think about just more broadly, yeah, the, I suppose, exclusionary impact of um of technology in terms of not everyone has equal access to, um, you know, the internet and all those kind of factors sort of start to compound and, and yeah, we can see scenarios where, um, where inequalities are stretched out even further by technology rather than bringing people closer together. And yeah, there's sort of the, the age factor is, is certainly a good example of that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, any other thoughts on that one? I think whilst, um, again, going back to sort of that inequality ageing population, I think whilst, you know, snail mail and that sort of, you know, availability to paper is still around, I think that the uptake to e-commerce will still be an ongoing process. Like it's, it's always going to have its barriers for certain people just because there is another mode that can give you the exact same process with essentially the same equal rules but people understand them far more simply mm -hmm. yep so so sort of having trying to have the best of both worlds by having multiple avenues available and and yeah people can can choose because i mean it's sort of yeah i suppose it goes the other way too with younger people there are probably um, not not saying that young people don't know how to post a letter or anything, but there are people of a younger generation who would be more comfortable doing things online and, and electronically rather than some sort of hard copy version of things. So, yeah, sort of giving people options and choice is, is yeah, perhaps an important way forward with some of this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, any other sort of thoughts and ideas on that one. I mean, an interesting thing, sort of thinking, I suppose, more in terms of um, the legal side of things is the interesting sort of, it's now very ubiquitous in contracts is that it's, 
you know, the clauses on, you know, from now on um, service by email or, you know, electronic communication is, is fine and accepted is this really shows, I think, an interesting distinction where it's viewed as equivalent and just as good, but it still needs to be said up front that we're okay with it, even though, of course, everyone is sort of thing. So there's, yeah, there's still these kind of, um, I suppose, holdovers uh, that are, that, um, that linger, um, that we need to, I suppose, be mindful of as well. There's also some um, interesting sort of things around um, security and, and data security and privacy, but we'll circle back to those. Um, for now, um, and unless there were any other comments on, on that first question. The other thing that I thought would be useful to, um, I suppose, discuss and, and reflect on the, the question I've got down, and you know, it's not one that's in the, the tutorial guide, is a sort of reflective question about what technology will mean for your legal career. Um, and I recognise that you know we're we're recording here, so if you don't want to um, say your personal plans for your legal career, that's fine. We can just sort of talk in general terms. But equally, if you've got you know a specific pathway in in your mind that that you're happy to share. I think it is useful to reflect on the ways in which technology is going to impact, you know, whatever your pathway is in, in the legal sphere. So what, I suppose, what do you see as um, some of the important impacts technology will have as you go forward? I know that, you know, you're pretty close to graduating. Um, I think it's important to have these things in mind. Well, interestingly, out of doing the clinic, um, that one of the things that was evolving was this whole basic lawyers online, um, which I found, you know, obviously a sign of the times with current technology, everyone's becoming quite okay with Zoom. Um, and yeah, I, that was quite interesting. So an, an actual law firm or practice all online no like lawyers all over like who are all part of the same firm but mm. location still practicing the same sort of law but yeah online yeah yeah the the entire concept or idea of a you know a, a law firm an office that you can go to obviously that will endure i would expect but yeah just not being locked into that model is a really interesting and dynamic shift. Absolutely. Uh, what else? What about the courts? Like, I'm not quite sure how they've gone about this whole new electronic aspect because they're obviously more inclined towards paper copy of things. So, mm. uh, like, how have the courts handled this whole online life? Because, um, I've worked in both private practice and in government and very different worlds mm. where the private practice was very um, paper orientated and then government was, everything was soft copy unless they had to go to court where everything you had to print, put in folders and then go to court. So I, I just don't know how the courts would turn into a fully electronic without that hard copy in front of them that they've always relied upon yeah i wouldn't expect that it will be a complete shift by any means i think you know it's been interesting the um even just the shift necessitated by um lockdowns and stuff to um you know video conferencing hearings and and things like that you know that was that was a dramatic enough shift i think for the courts as an institution but yeah, there will there will certainly be a stronger trend towards online submission of documents, certainly. Um, but yeah, I think I think the paper has got some legs in it yet for sure. Um, what that means, and and you know these issues overlap as well, right? When we think about an online law firm. Um, 
the you know where you don't have a sort of I suppose a a centralized building printing resources all supplies all that sort of stuff you know where that burden shifts to people working from home or people working from different locations that in itself I think produces an interesting dynamic as well about you know where where paper trails linger and they will then yeah how do we how do we factor that into a, a fully online legal service delivery model um is yeah an interesting question that i think each place will probably have to figure out for themselves really um any other thoughts i think property law is a, probably a standout about online i mean you've got your conveyancing you've got you know your property registered um you know there's a lot of property law that's already electronic mm -hmm. and it's you know doing obviously quite well it's working yeah yeah absolutely so perhaps a um um a model a model for for other areas of practice yeah yeah it's a good point what about um and i'll i'll bring up a couple of um I suppose interesting surveys and we can discuss those. So this is the um, chief legal officers surveys. They run them every year and they basically interview um, about 500 of the sort of CLOs of various companies and, and things like that. And it's really interesting the trends that are emerging over the past couple of years. So um, one thing that the key thing that is standing out year on year is concern or the importance of data protection and privacy um, and cybersecurity. For a couple of years now, that has been the one of the most important um, areas that the CLOs themselves identify as important, and also that the CLOs say that you know they're. Um, they're being asked about all the time. So thinking in particular, and you know, there's there's some readings on um, on privacy in this week's study guide, but thinking about privacy and data security is, is absolutely huge going forward as well. Um, there's been an interesting um, play around the, I suppose, use of in-house versus outsourced legal work as well. So um, in, in the 2020 survey, 33, so one in three expected more outsourcing to law firms over um, in-house. But this year they're saying 49% um, expect to add more lawyers in-house. So, and, you know, the people who do this survey are putting that down to um, sort of an interesting shift related to COVID um, whereby, you know, companies are wanting to manage risk and manage human resources by having things done more in-house than perhaps they were expecting before COVID, which, you know, I think is an interesting little trend as well. Uh, and then the other big thing is uh, artificial intelligence and, you know, 70% expect the use of AI and legal technology applications to accelerate in the coming years. So that's, that's really important too. And, and when we think about the role of technology in, you know, your legal careers, where, wherever you kind of take this, AI and, and that side of things is going to be, you know, huge and will have to be sort of factored in as well. So I'm interested to hear if you have any sort of thoughts or reactions to any of those numbers. Well, I think on the on the point of the cyber stuff, I mean, there's entire police task force that are just committed to cyber crime. I mean, that in itself just explains where technology has gone in that mm. route. I mean, the fact that there's entire task force that only concentrate on that particular aspect means that there's obviously legal recourse there for, for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you know, it's not, yeah, it's certainly not a surprising um, number by any means, absolutely. 
Yeah, just on the cyber security, we're certainly notice, noticing an increase in that in the organisation I work for. Um, we've brought on more cyber security specialists. Um, we're a superannuation fund, so we have to be very mindful of people wanting to hack into our servers, um, particularly people acting um, or impersonating themselves as a member and gaining access to their personal information and using that to call in to access funds. Um, so yeah, it's really quite prevalent in the organisation I work in. Um, we've also increased um, the size of our legal team recently as well, and also in our risk team. Um, but I think that's a combination not only of COVID, but also we're merging to entities at the moment and also going through an acquisition. So, um, you know, as you expand, um, more resources are needed to deal with the bigger bandwidth of, of issues that, um, you know, come up. So, yeah, so we're seeing an uptick across, you know, the risk, legal and, and cyber security space, just where I work. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and you know, this ties into, again, not a surprising statistic necessarily, but um, so in terms of the CLOs were asked to rank um, the the you know the which sort of functions were most common to them and, and their work and so compliance was obviously number one but then privacy um came in second and it outranked risk um governmental affairs ethics uh, and other things so yeah it's it's a huge space uh, especially in in the commercial law area so yeah, something to um, keep in mind. What do we think about um, AI and and all of that? Because that's, you know, that's the, I suppose, the looming thing on the horizon when, when you think about sort of future law careers. Is it something that worries you? It doesn't worry me. It, I'm more concerned about rollouts and how that works more so than the actual tech itself. I think there's going to be a lot more issues with rollout and the implications of that and usability and all of that sort of side of things rather than the actual tech itself. I mean, tech, I think we're all in that general sort of feel. We're all pretty good with tech once we know it, but I think it's that rollout that I'd be more concerned about. Mm, yeah, the sort of the inevitable teething issues with any of this sort of stuff yeah is going to be and i mean it's it's in itself that is going to create um you know whole areas of specialty um on the front end of things you know trying to check these systems over and make sure that there are as few issues as possible um and then at the back end when there are inevitably issues you know being on hand to kind of deal with it um so yeah there's certainly good to be keeping an eye on that the other thing that is um i suppose useful or important to think about in terms of ai is the way it will transform or shape the way that you do your job as a lawyer in terms of you know legal research so identifying you know, relevant laws and cases, um, drafting documents, especially, you know, simple stuff, that is going to be completely transformed by, you know, AI and machine learning to do a lot of that stuff for you, basically. Um, and, and in the commercial law setting, especially where, you know, there is so much scope for, you know, standard form contracts and all this sort of stuff. Being aware of, of the role of technology in that space, I think is going to be um, useful and interesting and important as well. Um, any other thoughts on that one? Coming from an IT background, I look forward to seeing these teething issues because <laughs> I know there'll be plenty. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be... It'll keep people very busy for a very long time, I expect. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's it's um 
it's but I mean, you know, it's good. It's good to be aware that that is one the direction things are going in, and two, knowing that that will be an inevitable byproduct of it, um, rather than yeah, I suppose one. I think some people are tempted to bury their heads in their sand and think that, oh, no, you, you know, it won't happen. Um, or at the other extreme thinking that, oh, yeah, it'll just come in and it will, you know, just wipe out a whole section of the workforce because it will just do everyone's jobs for them. There's no, a middle ground. I think anything that can make your job more efficient, so therefore you've got you know, you can get work done in a timely manner so that then you can actually see other clients or attend to other matters is only going to be a bonus. I mean, mm. statistically, lawyers are overworked anyway. So, <laughs> I mean, if you can cut back some hours and get a little bit more, you know, family life work balance by having AI, that's only going to be a plus in the long run. Mm. Mm. I don't know if everyone would would see it quite that way, but it's a good point. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, the temptation is to say, oh, well, you've got the AI helping you. Now you can get even more work done in the same crappy work-life balance. So, yeah. But, you know, we can cross our fingers, I suppose. Um, all right. Any other comments on on technology and, and commercial law? Yeah. On the AI stuff. Jacob, um, I read um, several months ago um, just around AI and just talking with our technology guys at work how some of it can be used to drive or understand the social behaviours of consumers as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they'll be able to tap into the behaviours of consumers, understand, you know, and, and some of that's happening now already. Um, so I think that's, a, that's an interesting thing where, um, you know, organisations will have a very clear understanding, um, really being able to target who their consumer is and where they're, you know, spending and what they're buying and, and so forth. Yeah. And really being able to change their, their market strategy to that. So. Yeah. Yeah, it is really interesting. And I mean, it's, I, I imagine you'll know more about this than me, Tammy, but I think when we think about AI, we tend to think it's, um, I suppose, um, sort of programmed AI in terms of it's someone typing in the code, telling the computer what to do, and it then does it kind of thing. But really, yeah, the direction it is going to go is more the sort of machine learning end of things where you just feed it a ton of data and then it you know, finds the patterns for itself and it figures it out and learns for itself. And yeah, that's sort of more what you're describing, Natalie, in terms of, um, yeah, just getting more and more consumer information and data and then, yeah, being able to become even better. And, and you know, we see it with Facebook ads and stuff now, but an even more refined model of, understanding behavior under and you know what will be really interesting will be the way that governments um use this as well in terms of you know you think about something like the australian consumer law um thinking about harnessing machine learning to pick up common problems as they're emerging rather than having to wait for you know the a triple c to go through the motions and then analyze something and then try and figure out what's going on you know there will be huge potential for a lot of that stuff too down the track absolutely um but not without teething issues <laughs> so there will be there will be that element of it for sure as well um well we might move on to some tutorial problems unless there's any other comments on on our sort of a uh, more principled and broad reaching discussion. I had a comment on the tutorial questions. That is question two. That was yes. not in any of our readings. No. Yeah, same. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I went looking for it and I did find some information, but I was like, hmm, was that an error? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that one, um, yeah, we'll see if we get time for question two. Um, and if we do, then yeah, I'll speak to that one a bit more. But yeah, I wouldn't, don't worry too much about that one. Um, 
we'll focus on on question one first. Um, so that one, Jennifer wants to attend a rock concert and go to a ticking. She goes to a ticketing website uh, and she has to click a box indicating her acceptance of the venue's terms and conditions. She does so without reading them because she would have had to leave the website she was on and she was worried about missing the tickets. Subsequently, the concert is cancelled because of bad weather and she finds that the terms and conditions preclude a refund. Advise Jennifer. So what do we think about this one? Well, it's that whole click wrap thing, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. So she didn't read them, kind of tough luck. <laughs> Yep. It kind of goes back to that eBay case too. So, yep. you know, like this once she's clicked it and she's moved on, it's deemed to have been read even if she hasn't read them. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Um, Pretty much what I was going to say as well. <laughs> once so, they click the icon, it seemed to have been binding contract. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, pretty... Pretty tough luck for Jennifer in that regard. Um, I think it expands or raises, I suppose, is there anything that Jennifer could potentially do? Um, thinking maybe not necessarily just about week 11 content. And, you know, in some sense, I'm being unfair because it's the week 11 tutorial question. Um, but, you know, we're also very much at the end of the term. Do you think, do you think Jennifer's a consumer? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So could she go to the ACL? Yeah. Do you think? Possible that she could. Mm -hmm. And she could possibly look at unfair terms by denying a refund, which comes under the consumer guarantees. Yeah. So, and, you know, thinking especially given that this is, um, yeah, a, a contract that's off to the side, which very much we would expect it to be a standard form contract. And so, yeah, potentially we're thinking about Section 23 um, feeding in and, you know, it's, yes, yes, she's bound by the contract because of the, the click wrap stuff, but if we can say that the contract itself was unfair, then, you know, maybe, maybe she's got some recourse there. But, you know, the fact that she didn't even read them is, is obviously is going to be a huge problem as well. Um, yeah. But again, that comes down to proof, right? So the ACL, as far as I understand it, has a very high balance on evidence. So if she's not able to, like, if she can prove, I mean, and this is the whole thing, how do you prove or not prove that you actually read them? I mean, it's a really dicey area. But however, the fact that, you know, there's certain things under the ACL that you must offer a refund you can't not offer a refund on certain contracts so if she can prove that I did read it um I agreed to the terms I wasn't expecting it to actually be cancelled you know rada 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 I mean there's still that sort of what I'm trying to get at is that balance of evidence I mean in e-commerce it's very difficult to prove that you did or did not read them mm -hmm. well and and this speaks to I suppose the whole a much broader idea and you know comes back to our question at the start about the um equivalence or otherwise of um i suppose online or or e-commerce versus um in-person stuff is yeah you know you you if you if you rocked up to um the little ticket booth and you know they've got the the terms on the back and they can say you know sit here and read it even if she didn't, there's at least, you know, some kind of, um, there's at least an argument to say, you know, she was given the chance. We underlined, pointed out to her, look, this part says you can't get a refund, la, la, la. Whereas, yeah, the, the 
evidential stuff is is really hard and it's you know it's one of those things that from a from the perspective of the uni environment um you know we can we can bend things a little bit and you know you can you can assume that things are true and stuff but yeah certainly thinking ahead the evidential and and it comes back to i suppose um some of the stuff that natalie was talking about as well in terms of you know um people calling in impersonating other people um you know at the extreme end identity theft and and all that sort of stuff you know how do we know how do we know that it was actually jennifer who bought the ticket how do we know that it wasn't someone else who stole her password or something you know it's yeah the the evidentiary stuff is just a whole nother world of complexity and you know yeah you're absolutely right to be pointing it out um but yeah at the same time there's only there's only so much we can do in a in a tutorial um but yeah good point I think tickets too in itself is such a dicey area. I mean, there's so much case law that has been all around different types of tickets. It's just ridiculous. Like if you go back to contract law, I mean, there's so much around tickets and whether you did read them, whether you didn't read them, you know, whether they're binding, not binding, like it's just, yeah, mm, it's everywhere. Yeah. And, and yeah, you know, the the you know it's printed on the back of the ticket versus it's on the sign out the front all of that stuff and and the way that that translates to the commercial the sort of the e-commerce setting in itself is interesting too right the fact that um that this was a um the terms and conditions were on a, a separate page that she would have had to go to and then come back um you know versus just having it all there easily accessible or something like that is yeah there's there's a lot of detail and, and nuance which is interesting um if not you know always straightforward <laughs> and i think we're all guilty of this too i mean i can't tell you how many times you look at some of those online terms and conditions you're like i don't have three hours to sit here and read this i'm just going to click the box <laughs> mm, mm. yeah it's um you know and i mean yeah, I think there's there's a degree of um, self awareness is completely the wrong word, but even just thinking through what the likely outcomes might be, you know, when you buy a ticket, you have to know that um, you know there's a possibility that the cancel won't the concert won't go ahead for whatever reason, and then you know whether you yeah just choose to go look they're probably not going to give me a refund i won't even bother reading it i'll just click yes and if they cancel it they cancel it like there's there's a degree of um i suppose being realistic about things as well um obviously obviously you should always read all the terms and conditions but i think and well and this comes back to our conversation before right in terms of certainly generational differences where, you know, where there's a familiarity with these kinds of things, you're also, I suppose, familiar with the standard terms, which are not always consumer friendly, which are not always, you know, in your best interest. And if you assume that mindset and if you assume the worst, then maybe you don't have to read it because, you know, they've done the worst anyway kind of thing. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's you know it's understandable that she didn't read them. It's just I mean, not... like each time your phone updates, and then you have to read all the terms and conditions of the new update, and that's like pages on your phone. It's like, man, mm. <laughs> yep, I agree. Mm. <laughs> well, and it's and it's interesting even thinking about, um, I suppose, the ones that uh, you can't just click agree. You at least have to, even if you you know, aren't reading, you at least have to click through them or, or scroll through them to get to the agree button rather than, you know, some of them, you, yeah, you don't even have to move the cursor. You just tick the agree and it's done. So, 
yeah, there's there's that whole element of it as well. I just wonder if sometimes the corporations or businesses make it so convoluted that even if you did read them, you go, I've got no idea what it says. <laughs> Like some of those, as I said, on the phone updates, each time you get a new software on your phone and you just go, you know, would the average person actually understand half of what is even written here? Like, mm, mm. well, and, it's and not user-friendly. No, no, not at all. And, and you know, that's what the ACL tries to be there for, right, is, is for to even where companies do try and, you know, uh, we can be cynical about it where they do try and deliberately make things as legalistic as possible um, to still try and get in those, those consumer protections for, yeah, for people who do not have three or four years legal study behind them. And yeah, it's, it's rough for them. And, and that's what the ACL, I suppose, is tries to be there for at least. Um, even if it doesn't, you know, even if there are sometimes problems with its application. The other, I'll um, wax lyrical for a bit. Um, I had a client um, who wanted, he did, um, he used to lay tennis court, um, the synthetic grass for tennis courts, and he wanted just a standard um, sort of contract that he could, um, give to his prospective clients and stuff and you know gung-ho junior lawyer I was like right you are getting so well protected there is going to be nothing no one's getting anything past you and so I did up this draft and then sent it to him and he went look I cannot give this to people to sign it's four pages of tiny tiny writing they're going to be scared off I don't need it all just give me something basic. So, you know, there's, there is a, an interesting, I suppose, commercial balance to be had between, yeah, the, the stuff that tries to cram in everything po as possible and, and, you know, confuse the average consumer, let's say, versus stuff that I suppose is, is more user-friendly and, and is designed in that way. Um, is something that's interesting as well. Um, and then you, you translate that to the the, um, the e-commerce setting. And yeah, as you say, you know, you're trying to read it on a screen or, or on, on your phone even, and it just becomes even more, um, you know, it hurts your brain even more. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, that's, that's something that we, will need to increasingly adjust to as well, right? More and more activity is done on people's phones on on these tiny screens. Um, and yeah, the way that that affects people's ability to get engage with these issues is is something that's interesting and, and that we will need to probably engage with better in the future. I think that comes back to what you just said. I mean, plain English drafting, if you're talking about e-commerce with a, a diverse range of people using, you know, this type of, you know, tech, it mm. needs to be that plain English drafting. Make it plain English, make it succinct, let people understand what they're, you know, basically signing up for rather than this, yeah, lists and lists and lists and lists of really mm. jargon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's... um. Yeah, but it's the nature of these things sometimes, I think. Um, but yeah, it'll be in the in the context of thinking about where legal careers are going and, and how technology is shaping that, that is yeah, really something that is probably gonna have to be dealt with and and especially thinking about consumer protections. That is something I think that the law needs to catch up on uh, a little bit more. Um, any other thoughts or comments about click wrap or poor Jennifer and the cancelled concert? No, but I did like the um, the the fact that this whole browse wrap is something that hasn't currently sort of been tested as such in Australia. It'd be interesting to see where that goes in the future. Mm. Mm. 
Because I mean, yeah, I it's... have seen that sort of sort of stuff before. Um, I think that's becoming more common too to try and ensure that people are actually reading the terms and conditions or supposed to be reading the terms and conditions. Um, so I, I, yeah, it'd be interesting to see where that goes in the future, whether that opens up a can of worms with the ACL. Yeah, yeah, because it, it's it's yeah, it's the sort of thing that um, I I you know I can't speak for everyone for sure, but I sort of I think I've seen people tend to be a bit more frustrated than I suppose you know when you when you think a browser app is there to be I suppose a little bit more consumer friendly and that it does encourage you to at least look at it. Um, but you know, I, I think that people often don't see it in that way. They see it as, oh, you mean I have to bloody click through all of this stuff and then tick the box. So it's well, particularly in like, for example, in Jennifer's perspective, like it's a transaction. So you're in a time sensitive mm, mm. transaction, and now all of a sudden you have to download this terms and conditions and effectively read it and mm. then still actually go to the agree. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see, yeah, how that develops because I would admit, I would imagine it would be very similar to the fact that, yeah, I'm sent a ticket anyway. So, yep, you've opened it, downloaded it, but you're still not looking at it. You're just going to go forward anyway. Uh, mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting. You mentioned the time pressure as well. I, I'm i not going to say that this would work, but I think it potentially opens up an interesting um line of argument that um, she was put at an unfair disadvantage by the time pressure and and you know the um, you know the mad rush to to get these tickets before they sell out and that sort of stuff whether that put her in a position where she was yeah at a special disadvantage where she wasn't able to rationally think through what was in her best interests which of course would have been to to read the terms and conditions. I don't and know that it would have succeeded. Yeah, I mean, even implications with online bidding, you know, you've got your Ebays and that sort of stuff where, you know, you've got mm. getting down to the last minute and you want to get that, you know, perfect bid, but now all of a sudden you've got to download all this stuff and read it and you're supposed to tick it. By that time, you know, you've lost this auction, this bid that you knew that you could have won. Mm. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see where it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, it potentially it, it, um, you know, it opens up something where you have to click through it all before you get onto the, um, the, the page where you can, you know, order your tickets or whatever it's, you know, you log on at, um, you know, 9.45 for the 10 o'clock release and, you're greeted with here's the stuff um, you go through it and then you can get to the ticket page. Maybe that, you know, people will still log on at 9.58 and want to get the tickets and they'll just click through it anyway. But, you know, maybe that, maybe that is, is um, a more consumer friendly way of doing it. At least some people will think, well, I'm sitting here for 15 minutes waiting for this to go on. I might as well just have a flick through while I'm, while I'm doing it. Some of those things though are also you go through the whole process of ordering or you know buying or whatever it is and it's just before that actual purchase button that a lot of the mm. terms and conditions come up. So even if you did it, you know, you can't actually get on at that 9.45 because the release is not until 10. So I can't even get on until 10 because mm. I need to go through and you know organize what I want, how I want it. I'm about to click pay and oh here we go terms and conditions read this. So that time sensitive issue is still there because mm. part of the actual, you know, your price, your, you know, is your agreement to the actual purchase. So that's where your terms and conditions tend to be because that's your acceptance of the actual you know, agreement. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tricky one. The, the, the timing and, and yeah, the sort of the, the pressure that it puts people under for, yeah. Well, and I mean, you know, COVID, the scarcity of of items and stuff is, you know, we're finding more and more things that are in 
short supply and high demand and you know if you don't get it now you won't get it at all that sort of stuff or shops close you can't get into them anyway so you have to order online (laughs) well exactly yeah yeah so it's yeah it's and i mean you know it just goes to to sort of reinforce that yeah this is very much an evolving area of law and it's and it's one that yeah you know it's and you know, I've said this a few times throughout this unit, but it's important, I think, to obviously the, the nuts and bolts of it are important to know and to learn, but the principles that drive it are almost more important because, you know, the law will constantly change and be updated, but the principles that underpin it um, either will stay the same or will shift more slowly. Um, because, yeah, who knows in, in, even five years time, who knows where some of this stuff will be. So yeah, it's, it's, I find it fascinating. (laughs) I do too. And I think it's almost, the ACL almost needs to run parallel to the whole evolving e-com as well, because if it doesn't, then obviously consumer protections are going to fall behind. And there's that opportunity then to organisations to deceive and get in front and, you know, make leaps and bounds at the disfortunate you know, party of the consumer. So it's almost like it needs to be constantly running parallel with each other. Mm, mm, yeah, absolutely. And it's, I mean, you know, it's a bit outside the scope of this course, but, you know, the the speed at which these things can update, um, you know, yeah, we want, we want, especially something like consumer protection, we want that to be really fast paced and able to keep up with developments as quickly as possible. But, you know, we also want the, um, you know, whatever the responses are to be well informed and considered and, you know, go through the democratic process and, and all those sorts of things too. So even, even balancing some of that stuff is, is, you know, harder in practice than, than, you know, obviously we would like it to, to keep up as quickly as possible but and you know we said this before the the use of ai and machine learning i think to pick up some of these trends more quickly um will be an interesting sort of way forward as well hopefully yeah we do sort start to see um you know a more a, a quicker response to some of these trends because yeah at the moment it is just relying on the heavily overworked a triple c to pick these things up and and you know respond to them so yeah it's it's there are a lot of different ways that this can go and it it will be really interesting to see where a lot of this sort of stuff ends up well again coming from it i know how quickly you can belt out software i mean it's you can get some really savvy stuff out pretty quick if you've got a succinct team I mean Mm. we were belting out software left right and center fixes you know like IT IT gurus will work through the night if they have to because that's what Mm. they're Mm. passionate about so they'll be belting out you know software left right and center and it's going to be that whole thing of can the legislators keep up Mm. Mm. who themselves are you know generalization a part of an aging demographic who may not themselves be especially tech savvy. It's, you know, it's a, it's a tricky bind <laughs> for sure. Um, I think, I think that sort of nicely segues us into um, a little bit of a sort of thinking ahead to next week. Next week, we obviously have no substantive content. Your assignment is due the day before Um I won't have them all marked by then, <laughs> um, but there, there will be time and scope for a little bit of a debrief of um, the assignment, but there's also plenty of scope to talk about, I suppose, broader principles of commercial law that sort of are interest of you, to you and, and, you know, thinking forward to, you know, life beyond uni i suppose and and how commercial law will affect your lives so you know i last year we spent a fair bit of time talking about the ai stuff we've 
I covered that fairly detailed today. So you may not want to do that. You might want to talk about something else, but you know, have a think about if there's something I know um, a few weeks ago, we sort of talked about banking and, and investment law and insurance law as being sort of topics of interest. So we can spend, have a little bit of a discussion about some of that if you're interested. Um, but yeah, if there's any other topics that you do want to sort of have a, a more um, wide reaching chat about, um, definitely do let me know and, and we can sort of factor that in. It's, you know, it's, it's really intended as, um, I suppose, a, a celebration of how far you've come, not only in this unit, but in your degree as a whole, right? To, to be at a point where you can have these conversations amongst colleagues you know, at very much the doorstep of, of graduation and things like that. So, you know, you don't have to, to say straight away, you can send me an email throughout the week, but if there's something that you do want to discuss next week, do, do let me know. Um, other than that, best wishes with your, um, with your assessment. Um, you know, it's, we talked about it last week. It's, it's what it is. It's, reasonably straightforward um, but I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys can come up with so um, I've said it before I'll just quickly say it again the daylight savings kicks in on Sunday and so that will affect the deadline for people who are not in Queensland so just make sure that you're keeping an eye on the clock and getting it in by five o'clock Queensland time uh, but other than that have a great week uh, and I'll see you all next week for our final tutorial. Exciting times. All righty. Thanks very much. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.